Lying at the end of the eastern Caribbean chain, near the northeast coast of South America, are the islands of Trinidad and Tobago. Discovered in 1498 by Christopher Columbus, these islands have reached the most interesting stage of their history and development. With an area of 2,000 square miles and a population of 850,000, they thrive on an economy, the mainstay of which is the petroleum industry. Point of Pear, the oil refining center, is a port of call for tankers from all over the Commonwealth. Together with sugar and asphalt, oil forms the backbone of the export trade. Tobago's history is perhaps the more colorful. In many battles, it changed hands time and again. French, Dutch, Spanish, English. As a people, we are of many races and of mixed origins, descendants of the African, the Spanish, Indian, Chinese, English, and the Portuguese, a people living together as one. We take a positive interest in the affairs of our country. In answer to a call to support the demand for independence, we turned out in our thousands to march as only Trinidadians can. Thousands of us eager to demonstrate publicly our readiness for self-determination. And not even the heavy tropical showers could dampen our enthusiasm. At Independence Square, we assembled around the memorial to one of the great sons of our country, Captain Arthur Andrew Cipriani, who from his earliest days had dedicated his life to the service of the people and the achievement of self-rule. A significant page in our history was written in 1960, when, with the departure of Sir Edward Beetham, one of our own, Sir Solomon Hochoy, became governor. I, Solomon Hochoy, do swear that I will be faithful and bear true allegiance to Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II, her heirs and successors according to law. So help me God. I, Solomon Ho Choi, do swear that I will well and truly serve our sovereign lady, Queen Elizabeth II, in the office of governor of the territory of Trinidad and Tobago and I will do right to all manner of people after the laws and usages of this colony without fear or favor, affection or ill will. So help me God. I, Solomon Ho Choi, do swear that I will well and truly serve Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II in the office of governor of the territory of Trinidad and Tobago. So help me God. By now, our government was insisting on independent representation in all major issues affecting the territory. Federation, of course, and the negotiations for a new treaty with the Americans on the Chagramas base. With the emphasis on the provision of higher education, the Imperial College of Tropical Agriculture at St. Augustine became a branch of the University of the West Indies. Another important achievement was the acquisition by the government of the national airline, British West Indian Airways. This was in 1961. The handover ceremony and the Premier, Dr. Eric Williams. Mr. Chairman, Lord Tweedsmere, members of the Cabinet, ladies and gentlemen. As you know, we are gathered here this afternoon to mark the formal transfer of British West Indian Airways Limited from British Overseas Airways Corporation to the government of Trinidad and Tobago. It only remains for me, Mr. Chairman, in acknowledging the documents and the check which have been handed over by Lord Tweedsmuir on behalf of British Overseas Airways Corporation to hand over to him our documents signifying his own BOAC's participation in BWIA and a check drawn on the Bank of England for 520,833 pounds, six shillings and eight pence, the sterling equivalent of the purchase price of two and a half million dollars West Indies, 
which to mark this historic occasion, I have endorsed as Premier for and on behalf of the government and people of Trinidad and Tobago. Lord Friedman. Ladies and gentlemen, in asking Lord Tweedsmuir to accept this document, I would just like to say to him that our check testifies at one and the same time to the stability of the economy of Trinidad and Tobago and to our readiness to assume the responsibilities of self-determination. Recognizing the importance of external representation, the government opened the country's first overseas office, the Trinidad and Tobago London office, with Sir Larry Constantine as commissioner. This office, intended to present Trinidad and Tobago to the investor and the tourist, became the nucleus of a high commission. It was after the 1961 general elections that new heights were reached. Our country attained full internal self-government with an elected House of Representatives and a Senate. With the breakup of the West Indies Federation, this was the prelude to independence, as the governor hinted in his speech opening the new legislature. Mr. Speaker, Mr. President, honorable members of the House of Representatives, senators, to me and to my government has fallen the honor of presiding today over yet another stage in the consummation of the aspirations to independence of the people of our territory. The internal self-government which we have achieved, of which this new bicameral legislature is the symbol, represents a decisive repudiation of our long colonial past. My government is satisfied that the only real bulwark of independence, the only real guarantee of rational economic development is an educated democracy. My government like the Salmon, acknowledges that except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain that build it. Except the Lord keep the city, the watchman waketh but in vain. I invoke the blessing of Almighty God on all of you who have been given a mandate to build the house of self-government and to keep the territories independent.
Thus, in May 1962, final talks on Trinidad and Tobago's independence opened at historic Marlborough House in London, with the then Secretary of State, Mr. Reginald Maudley, in the chair. It gives me great pleasure to welcome here today the delegates of Trinidad and Tobago to a conference at which we hope to reach agreement on a constitution and a date for independence. As you well know, this conference has been preceded by a great deal of public discussion and debate in Trinidad and Tobago about the issues with which we shall be dealing. The last vestiges of external control, for better or worse, are about to be removed. And a heavy responsibility therefore lies upon those attending an independence conference to ensure that the constitution they are devising will be one under which the peoples of a former dependency can emerge and govern themselves as a single nation. This is the task that faces us here today. I have little doubt that with goodwill on all sides, we shall succeed. The islands of Trinidad and Tobago are in many ways more blessed with natural resources than many of your neighbors. And given good government and political stability, your people will have much to offer to the world outside. It is our task at this conference to try and create conditions in which the islands of Trinidad and Tobago can embark upon independence, confident of enjoying economic prosperity, sound government, and political stability. Now I call upon Dr. Williams. <clears throat> Mr. Secretary, gentlemen, it's a great honor for us, the members of the Trinidad and Tobago delegation, to be here this morning in this historic building, taking our place long overdue in the independence queue. For a century and a half, the dominant political issue in the Western Hemisphere in its southern section has been the survival of democracy. Democratic forms and democratic practices have traditionally had to contend against subversion, either from military juntas or from civilian conspiracies. The independence constitution of Trinidad and Tobago must therefore reflect the responsibility of Trinidad and Tobago for the realization of the ideals of the Western democracies and the Commonwealth in particular, with emphasis on the protection of basic human rights. In the final analysis, this is a matter not only for political parties in Parliament, but also for the vast mass of the citizen body in their reputable organizations, whether economic, social, cultural, or religious. To this principle, our constitutional exercises at home have given the fullest recognition. Number two, the steady progress to full internal self-government in the last few years has enabled the government to raise the standard of living of the people of Trinidad and Tobago to a level higher than that of many independent countries in the contemporary world. The improvement of the material foundations of our society is a necessary safeguard for the preservation and entrenchment of our emerging democracy. This will entail adjustments, economic and psychological, for Trinidad and Tobago in its relations with its West Indian neighbors to the rapidly changing world economy. The independence constitution of Trinidad and Tobago must therefore endow the government, which represents the general will of the people, with sufficient powers to sustain the responsibilities of independence to guarantee continued investment from all sources and to ensure the continued improvement of the well-being of the people. Number three, the people of Trinidad and Tobago represent a diversity of racial and national <coughs> origins and cultural stocks and strains. They are the product in varying degrees of a common subordination, either political or economic or social. The advance of democracy and the expansion of economic opportunities have already produced a substantial measure of national integration and cultivated a new sense of national dignity. The independent nation of which we dream is like to a grain of mustard seed, which indeed is the least of all seeds. 
But when it is grown, it is the greatest among herbs and becometh a tree, so that the birds of the air come and lodge in the branches thereof. Now call on Dr. Capildeo. <coughs> <coughs> Mr. Secretary of State, gentlemen, I am grateful for this opportunity to make a statement before this conference gets underway. Mr. Chairman, our objective is to have a constitution which would ensure the preservation of democracy in our country after independence. We want a judiciary which is independent. We want provisions which really guarantee effectively the rights and freedoms which ought to exist in a democratic society. We want parliament democratically constituted. We want a procedure for the amendment of the constitution which effectively protects us from the arbitrary exercise of the power to amend. We want the various commissions so constituted as to ensure that they function efficiently and impartially Further, and above all, we want provision made to ensure free and fair elections in our country. We have come here to make a genuine effort to solve the problems which now confront us. We can only hope that the aim of the Trinidad government is the same as ours. And we want to assure this conference and you, sir, that we shall do all we can to bring about an early conclusion of its proceedings and to ensure that the Constitution will, as far as is humanly possible, reflect almost total agreement between us. Well, gentlemen, that concludes the business of our formal session. I'd like to ask the delegates to the conference to remain in their places. They'll be good enough while the press and the television and the public withdraw. We have a little business to transact this morning. The conference agreed on 8th June that Trinidad and Tobago should become independent on 31st August 1962 and that it wished to be accepted as a member of the Commonwealth. This achievement brought pride to all citizens of Trinidad and Tobago. In the words of the Premier, In the short space of six years, we have travelled rapidly and peacefully from Crown Colony rule to independence. We have developed our economy by our own efforts, without help from outside. Our achievement is without parallel in the world, though we are only a small country. As the citizens of an independent country, we must preserve the qualities we have developed in the testing period before independence. We must work even harder than in the past. The watchwords I have chosen for the nation are discipline, production, tolerance. I appeal to you to let them ever be your guide to conduct. If we do this, we will build a nation which can hold its head high and be accepted anywhere in the world and which any other nation will be glad to welcome as a friend. One final word. As we march forward to our great day, let us do so as a united people bridging all the differences of class, race, color, and creed. Let us make a living reality of our new motto. Together we aspire, together we achieve. Let's forget to this PLM, let's forget to this PLP. Let's live in harmony, in racial solidarity. This is our place, let's forget this nonsense about race. Discipline, tolerance, and production for our nation. Laddie, tell them this slogan. Discipline, tolerance, and production for our nation.